So how did we get to this? Um, we live in incredibly stressful times. Um, COVID has changed us. Um, I don't think we'll know for a generation um, how it has completely changed us. I, be, I'm, I am wondering if, uh, if COVID will define certain generations of this time the way the Depression defined my grandfather's generation. Um, the internet is changing us, and that is uh, only accelerated with artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, we are in racial turmoil and upheaval. Um, I will say that um, the trajectory that I thought we as a nation bought into uh, following the civil rights movement is now seriously questioned. Um, and uh, it, it, these are these are stressful times. Um, every day there is another weather story of great concern. Uh, we have more mass shootings each year than we have days of the calendar. Um, it is stressful times, and it's that way even when we don't have an election. What there's not a lot of is joy. There's a lot of suffering. And suffering raises theological questions. Where's God? What is God's purpose in this? Um, why, why is this happening? I relate uh, with that. I, I, I have not suffered a lot in my life. I have not. Uh, but I, re I relate to Kate, Dr. Kate Bowler. Uh, Dr. Bowler um, teaches church history at Duke University. Um, Divinity School and um, at the age of 35 was diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer. And um, she wrote a book, um, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I Have Loved. Um, and it journals her journey through her disease and treatment and whatnot. And there's a moment in the, and there's a moment she narrates in the book where uh, a loving neighbor comes by, knocks on the door, is speaking to them, uh, offering words of comfort and probably kale. And she says um, to her, uh, uh, just remember, everything happens for a reason. And her husband said, I'd love to know what it is. And the neighbor said, I'm sorry, um, said, I, I would love to know the reason my wife has cancer. Um, uh, Kate's not the most progressive person, so she didn't call out her neighbor for saying the wrong thing. Um, she saw she saw the good intent behind it, but also unraveled the fact that um, if you if you give a reason that someone must suffer stage four colon cancer, you're kind of saying it's not that bad. It's okay. There's a larger purpose. Um, I am, um, and, and I, th I think we come to that because we've told ourselves, you may see this differently, check me on this, but I think we've told ourselves that suffering is an aberration to a normal life. And I'm not sure that's true. I think suffering is a given in life. It's not something to celebrate, but I don't think any life escapes it. Now, I've already told you that my life, I haven't suffered that much, but when I, when I think back, particularly in my uh, younger years, um, where I start with that is I have a, a brother who was born with special needs. And my brother Gene, um, I've told you about Gene before. Um, he loves um, he loves uh, me to tell you about him. He th he actually thinks that's why you come to church is to get an update on how my brother is doing. Um, but uh, for a long time in my life, um, I was pretty angry that my brother's life options were limited and shaped by this for no fault of his own. I was angry at God, and I think I asked why. I wanted to know why, and I'm in a different place now. Um, uh, I'm not angry, but 
I do not want an explanation. I actually would find an explanation offensive because it would imply that there's a good in this. And he is good, and a lot of good has come from this, right? But that's not to say that that is good. We have to make that distinction. Um, and so um, I have also studied this in my own ministry and journey and have come to the conclusion that our faith really gives very poor answers as to why there is suffering. There's just not a lot of there there in our own faith. But what our faith does do is call us to battle it, to not accept it, to not let it be definitive of us or the world, not to explain it, but to battle it. And so I'm going to be talking about that some in this conversation. Um, and I think Paul leans in that way. And so um, I began to dig into Philippians and say, Paul, I'm not that joyful a guy, but I'd like to be. So be my teacher. What, uh, what can you teach? So here we go, Philippians. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God for every remembrance of you. Always in every one of my prayers for all of you praying with joy for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this. That the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because I hold you in my heart. For all of you are my partners in God's grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I long for all of you with the tender affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what really matters so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. So um, so let's break it down. Let's walk through, um, let's walk through some of it. So um, first of all, a letter in Paul's day always began um, with a certain structure. Uh, the structure is always first, you identify the writer, all right? So if, if in our day, the writer is always identified at the end, um, you know, love Tom, all right? It's so, but in, in their day, it was always identified at the beginning, and then you identify the reader, and then their words of grace. And then there's a thanksgiving. And Paul adopts this structure. It was the structure of the ancient world. He adopts this structure in almost all of his letters. Um, he does not do a thanksgiving when he writes the Galatians. Um, <laughs> uh, he omits the thanksgiving. He is not thankful for them. But he, um, he, he does this structure in all the other letters, and he plays with it so that you can tell something about what's coming with the way he is creative in these set pieces. And so he says here, Paul and Timothy, Timothy didn't write the letter. Um, he's just saying, Timothy is with me. And it's just kind of a reminder that even apostles don't go it alone. Um, and so Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Why did he add that part? Servants of Christ Jesus, they know who he is. He doesn't need to say, I'm Paul with the red hair. So what's being said is that this is a title that Paul claims for himself. And part of what he's saying, if I understand the text, is everybody around here thinks I'm a prisoner of Caesar. But I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. And... I, I, uh, I may look to you like a prisoner of Caesar, but I am a servant of Jesus Christ. 
And so here's the other thing the masterful preacher is doing. He's saying, and if that's who I am, who are you? Who are you? Um, because one of the things that we know is Paul is unpacking this joy and uh, in the face of suffering, probably because the Philippians are experiencing some pressure themselves. And so he's reminding them, uh, this is who who we are. All right, I want to I want to push through some more. Um, look at verse three. I thank my God for every remembrance of you always and every one of my prayers for all of you praying with joy for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I thank my God in every remembrance of you. Who have you ever said that about? That every time you remember this person, you are just thankful to God for this person every single time. He doesn't say, I am thankful for everything about you. He doesn't say that. He says, I am not somebody. Somebody said it already. He said, there is good in you. There's good in you. I see it. I am going to hold that up every time I remember you. I am going to remember what is beautiful and lovely and holy and honorable about you. I will thank God for, uh, for that in you every time I remember you. I also remember some other stuff, and we'll talk about that later in the letter. But I will thank God, and I'm here to tell you, gratitude is not the same thing as joy, but it is fertilizer on joy. It, it, the the more we can be attentive to our gratitude, the easier it is um, for us to be joyful. And what he says he's grateful for is the sharing in the partnership of the gospel. We are in this together. We are physically separated, but not even the bars of the prison cell can separate the fact that you and I are in this together. Um, the Greek word is koinonia, and it, it is the deepest form of community. Um, and so, so there's this, just from the get-go, there is this saying, remember who you are. Um, you are not defined. Um, you're not defined by what the world has done to you. You are defined by what Christ has done for you. We are servants of Jesus Christ. He, said, he holds up this model of gratitude and gets specific with them about what the gratitude is. And then he, um, he moves on. Um, we're not going to read every verse. I, I, I don't want you to think this is going to take forever. It, it may seem like it, but it's not going to take forever. Um, his next verse, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. This is also, this verse is also touching a theme that is in Paul's marrow. It doesn't show up just here in Philippians. It shows up in, in all, of his, all of his writings. Uh, the day of Jesus Christ is what the gospel writers would call the kingdom of God, or Matthew calls the kingdom of heaven. Um, you hear me refer to it as the promised day of God. It's the day of Jesus Christ. It is, it is that ultimate promise that God will make everything right. And, and what Paul does is he connects that ultimate redemption with foretaste of that already. That, that, that is already begun in you. I've seen it. You've seen it. Um, it, it is there. And we're, God will be faithful to that. Um, he's, he's taking the long view um, I, um, uh, I read about James Stockdale. Um, James Stockdale was, um, became an admiral, um, and, um, gosh, wasn't he, wasn't he the vice presidential candidate with, was it Ross Perot? I think so. Anyway, early in his career, he was shot down in Vietnam, and he was a POW for eight years, and, um, he was finally brought home, and 
and there was an interview and he was asked, how did you make it? And he said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never lost faith in the end of the story. And he said, so I knew that the day would come when this would not only be well, but this would be become a defining good in my life. I never lost faith in the end of the story. They asked, who didn't make it? He said, the optimists. The optimists would say, we'll be out by Easter. And Easter would come, and they wouldn't be out. And say, well, we'll be out by the 4th of July. And the 4th of July would come, and they would still be in POW camp. We'll be out by Christmas, and Christmas would come, and Christmas would come again, and Christmas would come again. And he said they couldn't, they couldn't serve because they weren't looking to the end of the story, and that is where our ultimate hope resides. Now, the end of the story that Stockdale is talking about is leave no one behind, um, and and that you know this, the the promise of our military, and that's powerful and real. The end of the gospel story is the ultimate work of salvation for the whole of creation. And that's what Paul is lifting up here. Um, so in, in just a few verses, in, in pretty clear fashion, he's, he's kind of laid a foundation for some ways that we can claim joy even in the face of, of challenging circumstances. So Paul continues, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the progress of the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. That's uh, verse 12. So students of the text, we... We have the text, but we also try to figure out what's behind the text. Uh, what, what's, what's going on before? This is, this is not the first correspondence between Paul and the Philippians. And so, so what is he trying to speak to? What questions or needs is he trying to address? And here's what I want to suggest is the question behind the text here. They're concerned about him. He's in prison. You know how worried you get when your preacher's in jail. And so they're, they're concerned for him. And so they've sent, they've sent word, Paul, how are you? You know, are you okay? Are you cold? Are you lonely? Are you being tortured? Paul, how are you? That's part of their concern. There's a question behind the question too, though. And that is, Paul you're the apostle if this is how the world treats you how are they going to treat us and his response is i want you to know brothers and sisters that what has happened to me has actually helped to progress the gospel but paul are you okay i want you to know brothers and sisters that what has happened but but are are you eating are you getting food do you do you need companion I want you to know, I think this is his answer to the question. And what he says is, the guards know that I am here because of my faith in Jesus Christ. I am engaged in ministry even here. There is nothing that Caesar can do that takes that away from me so I'm fine. I have a dear friend. She actually was on the PNC that brought me to village. Her name is Priscilla. And Priscilla uh, has been a firecracker her whole life. She has gone through life demanding to see the manager and making things right. And, and just sort of, uh, she is a force for good. Um, but she's... She's older now, and she doesn't have the energy that she once had. And, and I, 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 I saw her once. We had prayer lists that we had in little 
pockets in the hallways that people could come by and just pick up a prayer list if they wanted to. And I saw Priscilla, and she was reading over the names on the prayer list. And I, I said, Priscilla, I, I didn't know you prayed. And she said, well, I didn't used to. <laughs> I, said, I said, well, what changed? And she said, you know, Tom, it's about all I can do now is so I go every week and I grab this list and I talk to God about everybody on this list. And I know some of them, most of them I don't, but it's about all I can do now. And she said, but you know what? It is what I can do now. And I think that's what Paul's saying. We all have ministry. And in some seasons and circumstances, it's robust. And in others, it's modest and timid, but it's never irrelevant. He says, I want you to know that what has happened to me has contributed to the progress of the gospel. I am fine. But also notice that he says this. He says, the guards know that I'm Christian. That's not a really high bar. He didn't say, the guards are coming to prayer meeting. He didn't say, I'm scheduled to baptize Caesar next week. He did not say that they believe, they just know he does. I think there's a huge lesson in this. For far too much of European American Christianity, we have assumed that our job was to make our neighbor Christian. Our job is much harder than that. It is to be Christian to our neighbor. On that great getting up morning, I don't think Jesus is going to ask me, Tom, your best friend all through high school was Nanny Martin. Why isn't he Christian? I don't think that's what he's going to ask. He's going to ask, you could have been Christian here. You could have been Christian there. That's what Paul says. They see me. They know my trust in Jesus Christ, and they know my love for you, and that's enough. God can do with that what God's going to do. I'm not called to capture their heart. I'm just called to live the truth of my own, to be Christian to my neighbor. Does that make sense? This is um, uh, just a, a brief paragraph that I want to share with you. To say it again, when it comes to suffering, Christian faith is short on answers as to why, but consistently calls us to battle suffering. If I understand this letter, Paul battles. This book is called Joy Even on Your Worst Days, but let me be clear, there is no silver bullet here. There is no easy fix or four-step system to make it all better. There is just the testimony of an ordinary man with a trust in God who writes from a prison to all who are in Christ to offer us a witness. I find it a reliable witness. When suffering comes to you, and if it hasn't yet, it will, Paul would say, your suffering is not evidence that God has stepped away or is taking a nap or has forgotten who you are. No, suffering is the battlefield. Suffering is not actually an aberration. Where did we ever get that idea, given that the one we worship was crucified? Suffering is the circumstance that persons of faith engage, and even if we cannot change the circumstance, we nevertheless endeavor to sing a song of joy through the dark of night. It is a song that bears witness to our trust that the morning is coming, and that the love that makes sense of the world will not let us go. Uh, we close with a word of prayer. If you need um, a parking thingy, they're right here. Um, if, you, uh, if you'd like a copy of the book, I'm glad to give that to you. But again, you know, you're not going to need it um, for the class. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the difference you made in the life of Paul. 
for the ways that you made it possible for him to make a difference in our lives. We thank you for the difference in our life that we know here at this church. And we pray for that to continue at every church that you love and sustain and bless as you have this one. Keep us in your care as we go from this place and bring us together again that we may share your love and be about your work. In the name of Christ we pray. And all God's people said, go in peace.